Okay, hello everybody. It's not entirely untrue that I've come here especially to do this, but I am doing some other things along the way while I'm here. It's nice to be here. And Gareth, as he said, um, I met him when he was in Manchester, came all the way over on his scholarship and of course was locked up in his stupid flat for an entire year and then came back to Sydney in February, which I don't blame him really. Anyway, um, while he was there, he told me about the opportunity to get some money to study the, re the impact of the cable on, I believe the mandate was St. Helene in business, health, economy and society and this is what we're doing. So I'm in my second trip now. Obviously I can't draw any conclusions from that yet because the cable hasn't been activated yet but I'm coming back next year and after that I hope that we will have some conclusions. Um, what I'm going to talk about today though is really amazing the way we project it. What I'm going to talk about today is just one small part of this and based on, I guess, my understanding and knowledge of the internet and education and how these things impact society and culture, this is what I'm going to talk about today. So, um, right, so, um, I took this picture last year and um, was sorry to hear about Nick Thorpe's death, by the way, because he was a really nice guy. But when I visited the museum in, Central, in, in Jamestown earlier this uh, November 2021, he showed me a bit of the cable, so if you haven't seen it, that's it. I thought it would be quite big. I thought it would be like, you know, the width of a man, and it's that big. Anyway, this little filament is going to bring a lot of things to the island. It's going to bring a lot of information to the island. And obviously this connection that it makes between the rest of the world and St. Helena, a lot of information is going to flow down this cable and a lot of the things that you have spoken about in terms of the education that needs to be done, in terms of the learning that you need to undertake, whether in schools or in businesses and so on, all of this is very important. You are going to have the opportunity to consume a great deal more information than you currently do. But what I'm talking about today is, in fact, just some points about going in the other direction. The internet is a two-way thing. It's not like television. It's not just a broadcast that you receive. It is something that you use to write the world as well, to produce information, not just to consume it, but to produce it. And I think it's important that you, as, a, as individuals, as businesses, as a community, and as a society, that you understand the reasons why it's important to appreciate the production of information and the opportunities that the cable is going to give you to produce information and, as I said in the title of this presentation, to have your voices heard in the world. Because this 1,200 miles, I believe it is, which direction is Angola? Kind of over there, probably, roughly, right. That physical gulf is not going to change, it's always been the case. And St. Helena's history has largely been defined by the great geographical and physical gulf that separates you from the rest of the world. But over the years, and starting with possibly that little post stone that you still have outside the castle, um, this little black stone, isn't it, just outside the castle, and going through things like the telegraph, <coughs> television, radio, and indeed the level of internet use that you have presently have been used to separate, sorry, have been used to close this informational gulf that separates the island from the rest of the world. So this latest change, possibly the final change, who knows what new technologies might arise in the future, but possibly for now the final change of broadband internet access will allow this informational gulf to be closed. And I think this is something that's important because saints have a great history. You have your voices, your stories, your opinions, your festivals, your sports, your poems, your songs, and so on. These all circulate around the island, but it's very hard to hear them more even so to have them listened to outside the island. It's hard to get information about St. Helena. I found this out myself, and certainly someone like Trevor Hurl 
who I will come back to later, one of the great historians or amateur historians and information agents for the island, have said the same. He lamented the lack, for instance, of um, a knowledge of St. Helenian literature, for instance, in the UK, or St. Helenian poems, St. Helenian songs, and so on. So, this is kind of what I'm referring to today. The difficulty that has arisen with hearing the voices of saints in the outside world has meant that there's a dominance of other people's voices when it comes to talking and finding out things about St. Helena. So it's not saints' voices that are heard, it's the voices of other people, including a variety of, let's say, less savoury individuals. I mean, there's a lot of travel writing that's done, and generally travellers' tales have been a great source of information. Um, you call them white ants, right? I don't mean termites here, I mean the consultants and so on, all these people, right? People like that who come here, you know, write their stuff, and it's not saints' voices that are being heard when it comes to the decisions that are being made about economics and so on. Um, look, the only thing most people in Britain remember about any governor of St. Helena is Governor Massingham who fell off the boat, right? I'm pretty happy, right? Sorry, but that's generally what we hear about. I won't even mention the name of this newspaper, which I find execrable. It's a posh word for shitty. <laughs> you know, going on about its 300 million, or constantly ranting about the stuff and moaning about the one pence per person per week that it costs the British taxpayer to keep sampling. I mean, what a, this is just a random newspaper story, maybe you remember it, but anyway. These are not the voices of saints, these are not the voices of people who live and work here, they but are nevertheless, nevertheless still the most commonly heard discourses about St. Helena, and you know, I think it's time that this changed, to be honest, for the benefit of everybody. And I'll come back to the point in a minute about the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic value, but in extrinsically there are definite benefits to having one's voice heard in an environment where there is a lot of competition for attention and competition for resources particularly in the uk at the present time where we have a government determined to cut absolutely everything let alone the grant and budget to this place i mean every community in the uk faces this at the moment but in 1987, this academic Michael Goldhaber coined this phrase, the attention economy, and I think that it's something that can possibly be criticised, particularly if you think it means that, you know, as I say here, the idea that what's important now is that someone likes your blog post or follows your blog, and taking that to its extreme, you end up with people like Donald Trump, the classic attention politician, or indeed Mr. Boris Johnson, who, let's face it, if he hadn't appeared on British television so much in the 2000s, probably wouldn't have become Prime Minister. Sadly, he did, and we're still living with the consequences. But anyway, Goldhaber nevertheless does have a point, because if one wants one's voice heard in decisions that are being made about the allocation of resources, one needs to be able to say, hello, look, I'm here, I have a voice, I have an opinion, I have something to say. So I think it is isn't important both intrinsically and extrinsically that saints get their voice heard in the outside world. What I mean by intrinsic value is this general idea that if you are engaged in a dialogue with somebody, a dialogue means a certain amount of reciprocity, it means a certain amount of equality. I, we are not dialoguing right now, I'm monologuing at you, you know, and it, it works for a short period of time and we can talk later and that's very hard. But a genuine dialogue requires a certain recognition of equality with that person. It requires a recognition that that person you're talking to is a human being, that they have interests of their own, that they're able to express these interests, and that simply by the fact that you share humanity with them, you should be listening to them, you should be hearing what they have to say. So that's what I mean by intrinsic value. It's important that if people are making decisions that have an impact on the lives of someone, whether that someone be an individual or a community or a society, that they are actually listening to what that person has to say. Extrinsically is the kind of thing that I was saying about what Goldhaber said, the idea that by 
standing up and saying, look, you know, we have something to say here that one might be more likely to get one's opinion considered when one is allocating the resources in the world. So that's why I think it's important. And as an example of the latter, um, I mean, these are things that I've only found out through my familiar, becoming familiar with this place recently, but I believe if it wasn't, if there was a lot of involvement of um, non-British interests when it came to you guys getting your citizenship back, right? And I think it was Canada, I think there was some there was help from Canadian lawyers and um, people like that. So, you know, that was a period in time where Saints really did have to fight to get their voices heard. And, and you know, it worked out for you, I think, at least. Yeah. <coughs> And I mentioned Trevor Hurl earlier. I, I had to find out a lot about St. Helena in order to do this project and before I came here and since my first visit here and before this visit. I mean, if, if you don't know who Trevor Hurl was, he was a guy who originally came over to St. Helena in the late 1960s as part of the St. Helena Link and he helped set that up with the college in Cheltenham. I went and visited his archive. I mean, he died a few years ago. And his archive was now in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. It's 50 boxes full of amazing stuff. The guy could have done nothing but write letters. But what I cite him for is that he's an important example of an information agent. People used to go to Trevor Hurl to find out about something like that because there wasn't a lot of places where you could go. And since my first visit here in 2021, I managed to get myself co-opted somewhat as the webmaster for the Friends of St. Helena, who are now doing this you know, similar kind of role in the UK. And these are agents as well that are going to want to have other sources of information available to them in order that they can help direct attention towards St. Helena and its needs, and I'm thinking particularly here of video-based resources. At the moment, it's very difficult to get video off the island. It's going to become much easier to do that, and these are things I think you could look at, as well as developing more kind of real-time mapping and monitoring of things like environmental resources. Maria, you were just saying this, right, when we were just talking earlier, and I'm glad you did, because I was going to use this as an example a way that you have extrinsic value for the United Kingdom at the moment is as the United Kingdom's major source of biodiversity. I mean, most of the United Kingdom's biodiversity is right here. And these things matter these days. What you have is the potential, for example, and I am no expert here, and I use this as a, I hope not a facetious example, but the idea that you might tag wire birds and whale sharks. When I was practicing this, I kept saying whale birds and wire, wire sharks. <laughs> um, and that's a cabbage tree. Don't ask me whether it's a he cabbage or a she cabbage, because I honestly don't know. But all of these environmental data, all of these environmental resources can potentially now be mapped and monitored in real time. And these kinds of things can get attention to the island from abroad, not just from environmental researchers, but from, I would say, the general public, particularly in the case of one quite famous St. Helenian. Who do you think is probably the most famous St. Helenian currently, at the moment? Seriously. Jonathan, right. I, I, will, I will go with that. <laughs> I think he's the most famous St. Helenian. He's certainly the only St. Helenian whose unofficial birthday appeared in the UK newspapers in December. Stories on page three of the UK Independent newspaper, for instance, had a picture of this guy. <laughs> Look, laugh if you like, but I think there's a market for Jonathan Cairn. Okay? Uh, great, people are nodding. I wonder whether people would think I was being serious. I don't mean strapped to his shell or anything. Okay? <laughs> cameras around the garden, people would watch that. And even if it is a niche market, so what? So St. Helena is a niche market. It's always going to be a niche market, but it would get attention and publicity. So a semi-serious point, but why the hell not? Um, live streaming of cultural and sporting events now becomes possible. And again, um, Francis, I mean, I, I 
gave a sort of similar message when I um, spoke at the AGM of the Friends of St Helena back in October, and I said, oh yeah, you should uh, stream the football while France is playing, so Saints abroad can watch it, you can watch your Christmas parade, the Festival of Light. Anyway, when I said this about the football, some wag in the audience got a laugh by saying, yeah, we should make money by getting in touch with Chinese gambling syndicates, so they can, you know, we can lay bets on their football and make money. Look, that is a joke, but I think you have the capacity to do this kind of thing now. You have the capacity to film and stream debates, um, you know, public events of various kinds, like this one, for instance. You can't do this at the moment, you can do this in the near future. So I guess generally what I'm saying is, please bear in mind that unlike television, this cable, the internet, is a two-way medium, and if you're only really thinking about the consumption of information, then yes, you need to bear this in mind, but this idea of digital literacy, information literacy, about which I haven't spoken today, but there's a general idea about, you know, these are the skills and awareness that you need to make the most of these new opportunities. Literacy implies reading, sure, but it implies writing as well, you know? And these new opportunities that the cable will bring, it's not just about consuming information, it's not just about pulling information in. About quite a while ago now, in 2009, I wrote a book, the title was Information Obesity, because I used the phrase to suggest that if all you do is consume information, you just consume anything, you get fat, you get obese, you get unhealthy. Think about producing information as well. Think about the opportunities that it gives you to have your voices heard in the world, whether it's by lovers of giant tortoises or environmental, you know, environmentally conscious people, or whether it's just by people who feel that you know you deserve your place in the world. Now you have a much better opportunity to bring it to the rest of the world, and that's the end. And I would say thanks for listening, and also let's have the rest of the world start to listen to you. Okay. So, that's it. <laughs>